The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of GodQuest Ministries. Why would God order the killing of children? That's what we're talking about today on the Creation Today Show. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Hovind. And I'm Paul Taylor. And on today's show, we'll be discussing what angels look like. Do you know what angels look like? Uh, well, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. We're also going to be having a little bit more to say about radiometric dating. And we'll also be discussing, can a loving God really punish people? All that on the Creation Today Show, where we believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate in every single detail, and we are not ashamed to say so. Hope you enjoy the show. From the CTN studio in Pensacola, Florida, this is The Creation Today Show, and we've got a lot of great questions to answer for you on today's show. We have indeed got a lot of great questions, but don't forget, please, uh, about the questions that you can have answered at our Proof of God conference in March 2012. That's a very, very important thing to go to. Proof of, proof of God Proof Conference. Proof God. Proofconference.com. There we'll get you there got in the it. End. And that is going to be a great conference where we're going to teach you how to defend the God that absolutely exists. Not a God that maybe exists or possibly exists, but the one true God of the Bible. How do you defend him uh, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your relatives? Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. That's right. And who's going to be there? Man, we have got some incredible speakers, some absolutely fascinating uh, speakers on the topic, uh, and we're going to be there. We are we've indeed. got uh, Carl Kirby from Reasons for Hope Ministry. He's yes. going to be there. I uh, don't forget we've got Mark Spence from Living Waters Ministries. And Sides in Brigancate from ProofTheyGodExist.org, all going to be at this conference in Orlando, Florida, March 16th and 17th of 2012. So don't miss that. Yeah, you're going to want to register and uh, come, come see us there. We've also... Uh, are making some incredible progress on the Genesis series. We are really excited about that. If you haven't gotten to see that product, you need to go check it out at genesisseries.com. Uh, and we just, I can't wait to see Genesis come alive in a, in a 3D world where you're watching God create the heavens and the earth. Instead of just reading it, you're watching it take place. It's, it's going to be gonna incredible. It's absolutely amazing. That's Genesis series. Dot com. Genesisseries.com is That's where you can right. check that out. Excellent. All right, we got a couple questions. Uh, by the way, if you'd like to have Paul and I come and speak, we do live events, Creation Today live events, and we'd be happy to come to your area. Just let us know through email at creationtoday.org. You can uh, get our email address there, and we'd love to, love to come speak to your group or church or school or all of the above about what we love to talk about, God and His Word and creation. That's right, and we're quite happy to answer questions as we are now as well, yep. so keep your questions coming in. And we've got a question here from Daniel. Daniel says, uh, how do angels actually look? And he's got a several riders to the question. He I, says, I know the answer to that. Yeah. You know the answer. With their it. eyes, duh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> somebody taught my daughter, to, anytime somebody says, hey, how did you sleep? She goes, like this. <laughs> so I love that. How do they look with their eyes? Yes. I don't think that's what he really meant. I don't think so. I think he meant what do they look like? Oh, okay. Yeah. What do they look like? Yes. All right. Which, you know, I, I, I experiment on that by looking in the mirror first thing in the morning. <laughs> I but, experiment on that by looking at my wife. Uh, I'm going to get a little more brownie <laughs> oh, points Oh, you get the brownie you. points there, yes. Uh, do cherubs have four faces? Mm. Was Lucifer a cherub? If he was a cherub, then how can he be pretty, Daniel cases. says. Why are there different kinds of angels? Who is more dear to God, humans or angels? Well, there's a huge number of things altogether. That's quite a few. First of all, Daniel, we talk about creation versus evolution typically, not angelology. That's right. But um, we'll do our best on this. We'll do our best, but there are certain things that we can comment on. We're not going to comment on all the, 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 the strange and wacky stuff to do with uh, angelology, but uh, there are certain things that we can say. And we take that straight from Scripture, straight from God's Word. That's right. I mean, w uh, in Genesis 1, we don't read about what day angels were created, for example. Yeah, we don't know that. But since they are created beings then we know that they must have been created sometime in those six days. Correct. Because in those six days, God made everything that he made. So that must include angels. Had to, yeah. Yes. And at the end of day six, God looked at everything that he had made, and it was very good, which is why Satan's sin could not have occurred before that point. It must have occurred after 
that point because everything was very good at that point. So what do angels look like according to the Bible? I mean, do we actually know what angels look like? Well, we've got a couple of places, haven't we? Where, and, and there are various different descriptions given. You know, you've got the, an, the angel of the Lord des destroying uh, the people at the time of King David, who seems to be quite a, a, a large creature. Um, it's interesting that in secular, uh, in the secular world, they try to portray angels a lot of times as these, these little, uh, the cherubs is these little, uh, you know, the love angels and the, the cute little things. And, and man, when the Bible talks about these things, you're going, whoa, if you saw one of those, you'd be scared to death. That's right. I mean, powerful, mighty. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. I was Don't a, mess with them. I was a member of a church in South Wales where we had a nativity, uh, uh, play every year and the pastor's wife organized this and she <laughs> and she always made sure that all the angels in the scene were blonde haired teenage <laughs> girls that's uh, what i'm used to as well <laughs> and uh, i just can't imagine a blonde haired teenage girl doing what some of the things these angels did in the scriptures yeah. that god commanded i to don't do. know you know the angels saying to mary don't be afraid i suppose if you've seen certain blonde haired teenage <laughs> girls you would be afraid but <laughs> But that's getting a little bit off track. <laughs> it is. But um, um, was, was Lucifer a cherub? And I think this is perhaps the important point that we can, yeah. we can address, can we? Because now we can't be totally dogmatic on this, but we know that uh, I think what's been referred to here is Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, where, and we should yeah. mention that some people don't believe that this is talking about Lucifer. Absolutely. I think it's In important. Ezekiel chapter 28. It's important to mention that because there are different views. Yeah. I, I guess I'm probably of the opinion that it is. I, I am as well. Um, but this is where it talks about uh, Lucifer in the in the the garden and yeah. how every precious stone. Well, was in fact, the word, the word Lucifer is not mentioned in Ezekiel 28. Uh, okay. uh, Lucifer is mentioned in Isaiah 14, a similar okay. a similar passage. But in Ezekiel 28, it's talking about the king of Tyre and saying, "You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering." And it goes through a list of stones, saying, "You were an anointed guardian cherub." And it says, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. Yeah. And I think that's really, it, it sort of indicates we're talking about an angelic being there of some sort. And a being, therefore, who would be very beautiful, extremely beautiful. And a lot of people have this image, don't they, of, of Satan, the devil. Yeah, with being the horns and the red guy. Yeah, yeah. Probably not accurate when it describes him as an angel of light and, thing, and, and a being that people would be attracted to. Yes. And of course, in the New Testament, we read, don't we, that uh, Satan can appear as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, every, ev every false religion that there's been has been created by Satan. Only one true religion, That's right. uh, 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 which is the worship of God. But That's there have been right. so many counterfeit religions produced, and they seem appealing at times. They seem very appealing because Satan is a, a figure of beauty who will... Who will it he says almost deceive the very elect if that were yeah, possible. Yeah, and he'll appeal to different things. He'll appeal to things like your knowledge, your intellect, or or your emotions. And he's very good. He's had a lot of practice at fooling people. Yes. So we can't really fully answer the question about what a cherub looks like. Some people get the wrong idea about that. I think people sometimes think about the uh, the statue of Eros in London that people often refer to as a cherub because it's a sort of pretty baby yeah. figure uh, with wings. That's not really what Probably we're talking about. Probably not quite about. right. That's no. exactly right. No, we're talking about. Do cherubs have four faces then well that's that's again in ezekiel isn't it correct and where it talks about what are the i don't remember the four faces off the top of my head but it talks about him having the face of a a lamb a lion a cheetah and uh, am i right on that or am i thinking revelation no uh, well both in fact except in revelation we'll look at four beasts so oh, the four in beasts. Okay. i can't remember the four animals that's why i'm looking blankly at you hey google it but it's the same it's the same animals four faces in okay. ezekiel four actual creatures in Revelation, presumably talking about the same sort of thing. So, and are, why are there different kinds of angels then? Well, the, the answer to that is we don't actually know why. Yeah. God is a God of variety. And look around the world, exactly. look around to the different kinds of people and the different kinds of animals and plants. There is a lot of variety out there. That's right. But it's very quick to answer who is more dear. It's humans who are more dear to God than angels. And you'll find out That's more after this break.
Welcome back. You're watching Creation Today with me, Paul Taylor, and with Eric Hovind. And we were talking about angels, and perhaps we just rushed out at the end there. We were saying, uh, because part of the question that Daniel asked was, who's more dear to God? Is it yeah. angels or is it humans? And the Bible does say God created us a little lower than the angels, but it talks about, it speaks of how the angels almost envy uh, our position with God. Yes. We are made to give God more glory than all the angels. And I love the fact that, and I love it when people point this out, we are made with the ability to give, the God, to give God most glory. Yes. And we do that when we repent of sins and when we trust in Christ. God can get no greater glory, no greater joy than when we do that. Yes. for him, for our creator. And of course, there's no salvation for the fallen angels. There's no repentance yeah. for the fallen angels. They're all separately created. So there's nothing, no one who can represent them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's we who are represented. We're represented first in the garden by Adam, who failed on our behalf, and yeah. that's the sins imputed to us, and then represented again by the second Adam, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, and therefore uh, can have a salvation. Things that angels long to look into, we read in Scripture. Man. So that tells us something about the importance of human beings. Gets a little bit into our limited knowledge of angelology. So we'll move on to another question now. I think so. We'll go on to a, a, perhaps a more traditionally creationist type question yes. here from Roman. And Roman says, I've got a question about uh, radioisotopic method of dating. As some physicists say, carbon-14 method is never used for dating millions or billions years age of our planet. They speak of potassium argon, rubidium strontium, uranium lead, and other methods of dating. What can you say about these methods? Could these arguments be refuted? The dating method that I used most was just be a good friend hang out, have a good time. And that's what, that worked for me. I got my, and my wife and I get along great now because we developed a friendship first. Uh, that, so I don't know about these other dating methods, but that one worked well for me. Yeah, that might not be quite the dating methods as he had in mind. <laughs> all right, he's talking about radioactive carbon-14 dating, oh, which we dear. hear all the time as evidence against creation and for uh, against creation and for evolution, right? Yes, that, uh, that people will have done radiometric dating, perhaps using uranium lead methods, and found out that a particular rock might be, say, one and a half billion years old. And uh, I think there's some misunderstanding about this sometimes, and creationists sometimes a little bit um, loose in their language. You know, I've heard people sometimes say, well, that, that's because the radiometric dating method is not accurate. And that's not really the case. We're not arguing that they're not accurate. We're arguing that they're plain wrong, actually. <laughs> yeah. actually it's a bit more serious. The, me the measurements that they do, on the science that they yes. do on the actual fossil or rock or whatever they're looking at yeah. is very good. Yeah. Yeah, and we should explain as well that, uh, uh, generally speaking, it's not, with some rare okay, exceptions, it's not possible to do radiometric dating anyway on fossils, because fossils, by definition, will be found in sedimentary rock. Radiometric dating is done on igneous rocks, the ones that have come out of volcanoes, so okay. that you can try and estimate how old that rock is. So basically, what you've got is you've got a rock, say a lump of granite, it's got in it uranium and it's got lead. Okay, and lead is one of the products of the radioactive decay of uranium. So we so can as assume uranium decays, it turns it into turns the lead. It turns into lead, yes. Okay. So what they are going to do is they're going to take that rock and they're going to measure how much uranium is in the rock and how much lead is in the rock. There's no date in it. They don't knock the rock open and find there's a date down <laughs> yeah. the middle of it. Uh, you know, when, when I was a lad, we used to go uh, to the seaside, to a seaside town in uh, the northwest of England called Blackpool, and you used to get seaside rock there. I don't know if it's something that you have here. It's oh. a long stick of uh, sweet, sugary candy, very bad for the teeth. But oh. you broke it open, and inside was written the word Blackpool all the way through this stick of rock. And people often think that somehow you can break open a piece of granite and there's a date <laughs> yeah. stamped through the middle of the rock. It's not true. What they measure is the amount of uranium and the amount of lead. And they do that very, very accurately yeah. indeed. The only thing it says inside, by the way, is made in Taiwan. That's pretty much the only <laughs> thing you'll find in there. That's great. Uh, but the point is then that they have to use those measurements to calculate an Correct. age. Correct. Here's where the assumptions start yes. coming in. 
So the amount that they're measuring, nothing wrong with that. Most likely they're getting those right. They, 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 yes, absolutely. They're getting it absolutely very, very accurate indeed. But in order to calculate the age of the rock, they have to make three assumptions. First, we said that lead comes from uranium. Correct. So they have to know how much of the lead came from the uranium. They're assuming all of it yes. came from the uranium. That obviously. when the rock was originally formed, there was no None lead in it all. at all. How do they know that? If they believe that rock was millions of years old, how do they know? That's they'd true. Been, they'd have had to go back in a time machine and see the rock form. And that's only been done a couple of times, and that yeah. was in a movie, so that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> Second assumption, they've got to assume that none of that lead got there by any other means. You know, none of it was washed in by water or, or washed away by so water. So basically that it's not contaminated at yeah. all. Now, okay. of course, lead compounds are reasonably soluble. So the idea that a rock could sit there for millions of years without the Move. lead being washed yeah. out, yeah. even. It yeah. is, is really very, very unlikely. Okay. The third assumption is that the rate of change of uranium to lead, what's called the half-life of uh, the uranium, has never changed. Mm. And what's interesting is that even that assumption today has been challenged by many creation scientists. Because I'm wondering what all could affect the actual change rate. Is it, is it governed by location, uh, 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 things that... Things that um, uh, would affect it, like contamination, like water, like where it's located, like heat, uh, well, well, pressure. Well, that wouldn't necessarily change the radioactive rate, the, the, the half-life of the rock, but we do know two things that would change the half-life. And you see, uh. the, the whole point is that if the half-life has never changed, that's what we call a uniformitarian principle. It's okay. never changed, which, of course, we read about in Second Peter chapter 3. Uh, right. where, where we read that uh, people, there are scoffers who say that all things continue as they were from the creation of the world. But of course, there are two things. Yeah, I'm wondering what those two things are. Forgotten. What are the two things? Two things can... that they deliberately forget. They're dumb on purpose. <laughs> That's what the Bible says they about They forget the scoffers. that God created the world mm. and they forget that God flooded the world. Mm. And, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the writers who've been studying this and researching this have said that that is the two occasions on which the half-life of uranium could have altered. Wow. You know, there's a, a book called uh, Thousands Not Billions, written by Don DeYoung, which is actually, it's quite a tricky book to follow, but this is a simplified version, believe it or not, of another book called The Radioactivity the, and the Age of the Earth. The Rate Project the rate that project. ICR did. They did a great job with that. One of the things they did was measure the, uh, the age of uh, crystals in granites by two different methods. One by the radiometric method, where they got the 1.5 billion years, and secondly, by another reliable method using helium diffusion, which gave an age of about 4,000 years. Whoa! And Two both, totally different ages from the same From, from the, the same, same rock. rock, but also from the same radioactive process. So for both to be correct, wow. the only way that they can both be correct is that one of the assumptions is wrong. And the only assumption that could be wrong is that the half-life has never changed. Whoa. So in other words, the half-life must have changed. So the Rate Project really exposed a lot of this. And, and I'm, right. I'm really glad that they did that. Uh, by the way, if you haven't checked out ICR, that's the, the Institute for Creation Research, now located in Dallas, Texas, correct? That's correct, yes. And uh, they, do, they got some scientists on board that do some incredible work. So I'd encourage you to check them out and, uh, and get some of their resources to help you better understand uh, the, the scientific things that, um, that's right. that affect creation. But of course, thousands, not billions, you can get from creationstore.org. You could get that from Creation Store or their website, but we love it when you get it from the creationstore.org. Well, we're going to have another question coming up right yeah, after this Yeah, why would break. God allow the killing of children? Let's talk about that after this. Beginnings is a creation experience for small groups, churches, and individuals from all walks of life. Creation speaker Eric Hoven explores the age-old questions of life, the evidence for a young earth, and how dinosaurs fit in with the Bible. The included guide provides an introduction to each lesson, creative challenges, great discussion questions, and practical ways to apply each lesson to everyday life. To order this DVD, go to www.creationstore.org. You're watching Creation Today with Eric Hoven and Paul Taylor, and I love some of these questions we've been talking about. Cre uh, carbon dating, what's the truth about that? The different dating methods. Uh, what about angels? And I really want to get to here in just a second, why would God allow the killing of children? Uh, that is involved in one of the questions we have. In the last segment, we were talking about uh, how do you know how old the earth is? A great resource if you want to get that is 
The Young Earth by John Morris. Of course, Henry Morris is the grandfather of the creation movement, and his son John Morris has taken over Institute for Creation Research, which we were just discussing. So you really ought to check out his book on the age of the earth, The Young Earth by John Morris, a really good resource there. Well worth getting hold of. Well, we've got another question here, and it's quite a lengthy one. And uh, I've actually edited this down from the email. Okay. But uh, Jennifer asks, uh, well, she says this, while I do believe Jesus rose from the dead and I have no problem with the New Testament, I do struggle to understand the Old Testament sometimes. I cannot believe in the early books of the Old Testament. The later books I find easier to comprehend. I do not think I'll go to hell for not believing in a literal meaning of Genesis. I give my sins to Jesus every day and I know that's enough. When I preach to unbelievers, I start with the resurrection, not Genesis. My faith starts with Jesus and ends with Jesus. Don't get me wrong, I do believe there are lessons to be learned from the parables in the early Old Testament. I just cannot bring myself to believe in a God who would constitute people being mauled by bears or the killing of children. Wow. Oh, did God really allow yes. the killing of children? And that is something that people use regularly, not just people claiming to be Christians saying, hold it, can God do that? But from the evolutionary atheistic side, the unbeliever side saying, I'm not going to believe in a God that would allow the killing of children. That's not a God I want to believe in. Yes, it, it's quite a serious thing. There's a huge number of things mentioned in this uh, in this email, but the base, basically it boils down to, I don't want to believe in Genesis. We should just talk about Jesus. Yeah. And, and also then there's the bringing in of the, the idea that the Old Testament is talking about uh, an angry God who does a lot of killing, yeah. whereas the New Testament is all about uh, a loving God. I hear that all the time. You know the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, right? Well, look at Reed. It's different. It's the same God, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the same God. You think that allowing some children to be mauled by a bear, because I believe they were talking about, uh, who was that, the, uh, Elijah the prophet? His it's bald Elisha, head. isn't Elisha, it? Elisha, yeah. his bald head, and so he allowed a she-bear to come out and attack and kill these children. Yeah. People say, wow, I'm not going to believe in a God that would allow that. Well, you can believe in whatever God you want, but I would encourage you to believe in the God of the Bible because he's the only God that exists. Any other God is a figment of your imagination and you're breaking commandment number two. You're creating a God to suit your own needs, to suit yourself. That's right. You know, I, I'm, I'm from Britain, as you may have gathered. Okay, I, I got mean, that. I could really impress you, couldn't I, by telling you that I'd met the Queen. Oh, that would I mean, be impressive, Yeah, yes. now supposing I said, you know, I met the Queen, uh, the Queen of England, and uh, she's tall and blonde and very young. Uh, <laughs> I would say, hold it. I don't think you met the Queen of England. You no. might have met a queen of something, but it wasn't of England. Yeah, exactly, because the description that I gave is not the description you know to be correct. So if I'm True. describing someone, it doesn't matter what I call that person, it can't be the real person mm. if, that's, if the description's wrong. Now, in the same way, if someone says, well, my God is like this, I'm going to describe what my God's like, and their description of God is different from the description of God that we have in the Bible, then it's a different God, it's I'm a sorry. And that is a problem I see over and over and over as we travel to churches. I see people creating a God to suit themselves. They say, I don't want to believe in a jealous God. I want to believe in a God that is just love. I don't want to believe in a God that would judge me for my sins. I want to believe in a God that will just forgive me no matter what. Right. And I'm going, look, it's time we stop and we check out the God of the Bible. Stop believing in a God that you want to exist and believe in the God that actually exists. Now, presumably, when we're talking about the killing of children, we're talking about where God has commanded whole nations yeah. to be wiped out. And, uh, you know, the, the, the one example of that would be the Amalekites, yes. when God said that the Amalekites must be wiped out. And at first sight, if you take that out of context, that sounds very cruel. So, you know, what, what, what are we reading about here? We're reading about the complete genocide yeah. of a people. That's the whole point is you've got to read into it and read the reasons behind it, the background there. When you study that story out, and this is just fascinating, if, if God waits too long to serve justice, people get mad. If he gives justice right away, people get mad. They just want to be mad at God. God had given the Amalekites a long period of time, hundreds of years, A couple of hundred years, yes. And to turn to him and to stop worshiping idols and to stop treating their people and their children and their animals certain ways and... And they didn't. And so God judged them. And that is the problem that we see. People are judging God. 
when he is where we get justice in the first place. There is no case where God has, uh, has ordered the, the killing of people like that where there hasn't been a warning and yeah. a, a command to repent. Uh, you know, there was the warning of the destruction of Nineveh, but there, there yeah. was actually repentance there. Which Jonah wasn't happy about. That's he said, I don't want him to repent, God. I want you to destroy him because he knew how wicked and how evil they were. There was also the long-term warning of judgment on the Canaanites and on the Moabites. And what's interesting in both those cases that we know of people who were saved out of those. Mm, All yeah. of the peoples were killed. Uh, you know, there's Rahab at the Battle of Jericho saved because of her faith. There's Ruth saved out of the Moabites because of her faith, where she says, your God will be my God, your yeah. people will be my people. There's repentance and faith. And, and there's always salvation. So God is both just and merciful. Yes. The two qualities are seen there throughout the Old Testament. There's the mercy of God in giving the warning, but that the mercy will not last forever. There is justice as well. What would we think of a God who says, oh, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter, just yeah. let it go, and Hitler can be in heaven, and it doesn't matter, <laughs> everything. <laughs> it doesn't worry. It's not the God I want to serve. The God I serve is a just God. Now, uh, her question here, Jennifer says, I don't think I'll go to hell for not believing in a literal meaning of Genesis. Guess what? I think you're probably right. I don't think that's what's necessary to go to heaven. What's necessary to go to heaven is that you repent of sins and that you trust in Christ. That is what's necessary to go to heaven. But just so you know, you're talking a lot about Jesus. Jesus talks about a literal Adam and a literal Eve. He says in Matthew 19, 4, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So if we're just going with what Jesus teaches, well, he taught that Genesis was real, that it was literal, that it was historical. He wasn't referring to figments of his imagination or made up characters. He was referring to the literal Adam and the literal Eve. You know, with respect, we have to ask you, Jennifer, and people who have the same view yeah. say we should talk about Jesus, we shouldn't be talking about Genesis. We have to, with respect, say, do you actually believe the words of Jesus or not? Wow, that's what it comes down it to. Does. What are you going to believe in? Your ideas, your made-up God, or the God of the Bible that says, this is my word and you should obey it? That's really what it comes and, down and to. That's exactly what it comes down to. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for tuning into the Creation Today show. Remember, if you want to write in, you can write your questions to questions at creationtoday.org. You can also join us on Twitter, which is uh, uh, twitter.com at, at Creation Today on Twitter, and Facebook, facebook.com slash Creation Today. Don't forget to tune in to each episode so that you can see whether we've answered your question or not. And also there are questions archived at creationtoday.org. Well, this has been a production of God Quest Ministries. Thank you guys so much. We want to remind you that there are some more great resources, including some great Bibles at thecreationstore.org. This program is available on DVD by visiting creationstore.org or by calling 877-479-3466. To order this episode, use the item number displayed on your screen.